Hello and welcome, Paul from Cahot. Well, well, I'm going to say you're from Cohonas. Is that how you pronounce yeah, it? Cohonas, yeah, Cahonas, Scotland. You do. It's a charity. You do do a podcast for them as well. But I'm aware that you're not the person that actually let's set up the charity or whatever. But yeah. I'm looking forward to the story <laughs> on that. But anyway, before we start, I just want to show this a beautiful scarf by Slange Kilts. That's Cohonas. Tartan and Paul brought me my Sos Amiga and it's pure gorgeous at 100% lambs oh that'll be going in the good drum so we'll just sit that there um, so as I say you're from Cohonas um, or you're here representing Cohona Scotland which is the men's is that right? Yeah, men's because uh, women, yeah. uh, women don't have testicles women don't have testicles but it's a cancer uh, charity raising awareness for identifying would you say that in treatment of t t testicular cancer yeah yes. i mean yeah so we are education um awareness and support charity right. okay yeah, so, right yeah. that's the right words that's uh, what i was looking for <laughs> the right words to describe it so um so richie reached out to me he's yep. the guy that set up the charity i know nothing else about it obviously i understand the importance of the work that you do um, and I also now fully understand what the charity does. But also, this is the f I, a first for this podcast. I've okay. never actually had testicular cancer uh, talked about. So thank you. Oh, and thank right. Richie yeah. for me for reaching oh, out. Oh, well, So why is this story? Because you do a podcast as well. Yeah. Right. So just you tell me your story. <laughs> so I suppose to start off. Cajonas is the charity. Richie started it in 2009 and right. he started it because um, he'd went back into education and was doing marketing and PR and they had to come up with, um, it was some sort of kind of, um, oh, I can't really think of the words that they were doing, but it was like this campaign, campaign. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, to come up with. So he eventually kind of stumbled across the site of cancer and realised that there wasn't actually anything out there. You know, there was a lot of kind of stuff about you know, prostate cancer, breast cancer, but nothing really for testicular cancer. So mm -hmm. he just forced ahead and it kind of took over his life at that so point. So that was the only reason he identified yep. a gap in the cancer awareness yeah. thing out there and set up the... Ch so there's no an actual story of him being affected no, by No, so he, he... And he always says that. He so says, good. you know, he came across it just purely as an educational um, jump-off point, essentially. Um, was hadn't a, a you know touch wood, hadn't been affected by testicular cancer Aye. and all that, um, and then set up the charity. He was running it um, voluntary for I think about eight years, and then the board had asked him to step down as the chair because uh, they'd had a wee secret confab and went, we kind of want you to do the day to day, and they were able to take him on as the CEO, mm -hmm. and he started doing that for a living. Mm -hmm. So then during co uh, during COVID and all that. You know, um, he was kind of looking to take somebody on. I had uh, got involved with the charity, and this is where my story kind of jumps mm -hmm. in on it. Mm -hmm. So, so do you know him? I know him because of the charity. All right, okay. Yeah. Right. So, um, I was diagnosed in 2015 with testicular cancer. Right. So, you know, you're sitting in the car, and there's still only one ball between us. You know, right. <laughs> so um, I was diagnosed. And I reached it, and the only reason that I found my cancer was because of the Cohona self check guide that Richie mm -hmm. had put out there. And I had felt a lump um, when I'd been out for a run. Uh, it doesn't look much like I'd do much running now, but I did at the time. Yeah. And uh, I was actually running for a friend of mine who's um, his, his, one of his best friends had died of was it a cardiomyopathy. Mm -hmm. um, so he essentially had a heart attack at 42 and died. Oh, so we were doing just a, a charity 10K. And I felt a, a lot of pain in my groin. I was like, something not quite right. I'd heard about testicular, not testicular cancer as such, but I'd known about like kind of checking yourself and things like that growing up, but I didn't know how to do it. You know, um, so coming into the, the winter months, I started, I got the flu and I got really, really sore. So I was like, right, I need to go and find how to do this check. And did you have a lump? Did you, yep. were you aware of it? I wasn't, Before you checked? I wasn't aware of the lump, I was aware of the pain. So when mm -hmm. I'd been kind of like going down the stairs, it felt like somebody was kind of, you know, I always kind of say this when I do my talks, just, uh, you use my, scrotum as a, a paper towel dispenser, it felt like somebody was yanking on mm -hmm. me. So um, I was, I, so I thought, right, let's look at what this could be. 
frightened and paranoid that it could be cancer because you know, it's a weird pain to get. So testicular cancer, but I always put it in Scotland. Mm-hmm. For anything, I'm so patriotic. So if yeah. I want to find a Scottish thing. But you do want it to be local as well. You because do. I, if you need to message, or not that I'm saying there's that much of a language barrier or anything, but it's always much handier if even there's somebody you can see or speak to or whatever. I don't know. Everybody will relate to that. It is much better to be dealing with somebody locally, I feel, than, yep. than you know, miles and miles away. Although sometimes that is the only option. But you know what I'm saying. Oh, definitely. Anyway. <laughs> but you, you think of geographically, you know, you could be close to seeing somebody um, as well that I, could go, it's all um, right, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, so, cojones popped up. I'd done the self-check the way that it um, showed me on the the website and I found a lump so mm-hmm. that was my start of my cancer journey but with you must have panicked did oh, you terrified terrified uh. I've done a stupid thing though it's like because I go out and I tell people get it checked right away it took me a month to build up the courage to go out and see the doctor mm-hmm. because it was to do with my testicles it was to do with my balls you know mm-hmm. and so it's mm-hmm. quite embarrassing Aye. You know? and it is a thing you're absolutely right it is and that's why it's so important that we have this conversation because anything really men's health related does seem to carry like stigma whether it's mental health or physical health or whatever and then when you're talking about a man's pride and joy let's be honest mm. that's that's a ma- that's probably the biggest thing yeah you know, not literally well, that's but- what she said <laughs> <laughs> you're making jokes about it but it's so important to get the message across yeah. that it's you know it's so important to test and I know my husband like you know talks about it and you know we, we're quite open about it and you know thankfully we've not had any issue but you just don't know and it's that being able to have the open dialogue about it to then take the next steps which could potentially save your life exactly and that and that's the whole and that's the whole ethos of cojones is you know we want to kind of get young men or people with test skills to to be informed and educated enough that they don't have that stigma and embarrassment as mm-hmm. well yeah like i did so after i kind of went to the doctors and i was going through my treatment i basically said what i thought because when you when you look at cojones and you look at um the work that richie does the website and everything's amazing so I, I emailed thinking it was just going to be another email to this big charity that i might not get Aye. a reply from unbeknownst to me there's richie sitting at his his full-time job at the time you know getting an email for me saying eh, just from me and my family thank you for saving my life mm-hmm. so mm-hmm. rich at that point richie reached out and uh, we just became friends and over the years he's always kept me up to date with what's happening with cojones and then um, two years ago, um, I, I was still working for the NHS at the time. I was actually working in the immunisation team. Mm-hmm. So I was, got, gets a phone call and he's saying, oh yeah, we're going to take some, we're hoping to get, take somebody on. And I'm waiting and waiting for the ask. It's not coming, it's not coming. But three days went by, I, I phoned him again. I went, Richie, I really want that job. <laughs> so I was like, it's, oh, he, he couldn't believe that I would leave the NHS to go into the third sector. Uh... but. I mean, 20 years nearly I was working in the NHS. I'd kind of reached a, a glass ceiling for where I, I thought I wanted my career to go. I, I didn't do my training. I was a nursing assistant and I was really happy in that job, but I think, you know, I needed to expand out just mm-hmm. to, for me. And I think to help other guys who are going through just like their cancer, you know, at any stage, I've got a good insight into that because I've been yeah, through well, it. Well, obviously, I so, lived yeah. experience. I, was, I always say nothing compares to that. Nothing beats nothing. it. No, yeah. totally agree. Right, back to your story yep. then, Richie, because that's the thing. That's the most important thing. Somebody speaking, like we've said already, from lived experience and what you did and what your experience was like with mm. the whole, like, testicular cancer process. You found that. We got to the point where you found a lump. You yep. saw the the um, guidelines on the Cojones page and you identified that you had a lump. Yeah. So went to the, eventually, <laughs> went to the doctors. A month later. Yeah, mm-hmm. went to the doctors. And my doctor was great. Um, I'm really lucky that um, our local GP, being the family GP, so it was like known you for years. So he had a feel of it, realised that, nah, this isn't something I know what that feels like. Sent me up to urology um, and got a, 
uh, CTs to get a, sorry, an ultrasound. And again, even when I went up and saw the consultant neurologist, he, he had a feel of it and he went, you know, it doesn't feel like a cancer would feel. So that kind of gave me a little bit of hope and that, yeah, it's not going to be. But I went into the ultrasound and by this point I had my trousers down at my ankles that many times that I just squeaked my, my brakes down as I walked in. And the wee wife was like, son, I need a chaperone. I was like, oh, I'm really sorry. So I went to pull up my trousers. And just as I'm pulling up my trousers, the chaperone walks in at the back of me. And she's like, oh, there's a full moon. And I'm just like, oh, yeah, do So I just waddled across to the bed and was like, oh, OK. She's like, sit there. Alone. So All right, there's a, that's the thing. And it's very similar to like how women feel about getting a smear test. And, oh, I bet. You know, it's, it's that whole, like... Bef the apprehension and the embarrassment before you even go in is actually, it's, it becomes nothing because for them it is just normal procedure and yeah. they see lots of bums, willies and vaginas all day long, all week long that really, they, they're not caring. They don't what's, care. Uh, uh, and I th think that's the important thing to kind of say as well, I, they don't, like, because mm -hmm. you, you think... Oh, I'm gonna. Yeah, nobody cares. No. They're medical. They're, they're uh -huh. actually they're probably seen enough that like, oh, no, another one. <laughs> Do you know what <laughs> I mean? <laughs> I, I, I think they really want to say, I don't care, but yours looks like exactly, <laughs> exactly. Because they they're so nice and kind. Aye. So at that point, I went out back out. And my my wife was sitting in the waiting room, and um, we just started having a laugh and a joke. And the thing that didn't resonate with me was that the when I was getting multrasound, the the sonographer went you're going to have to go back and see the consultant. And that didn't really hit me of why I needed to do that until we went back in and he was like, so yeah, it's to stick by cancer for sure because they could see quite um, clearly on the, the ultrasound. And, and was that when you, you found out when the consultant said it to yeah. you, that was when you knew? They yeah. never said before that that it does look like cancer or anything? No, it was, it was at that point. And even then, it didn't really hit home. You know, mm -hmm. it was just kind of... You see in the movies when like people get bad news and you hear like um, like this really sharp ringing. So I've got tinnitus anyway, so I hear that type of ringing, but it just felt like it got louder and louder and louder. And I was so glad my wife was with me because if I, she took in more information than I did about what was the next steps. And I, I remember just sitting there numb going, oh my God, like I've got cancer, you know? And you don't hear it any other words. You know, people talk about, you know, what it is it's like you hear testicular but you just hear the word cancer that's mm -hmm. the big mm -hmm. overarching thing uh, and yeah at that point you know your life just suddenly goes right okay what do we have to do mm -hmm. you know at this point so yeah so they do say that about having somebody especially well you never you don't know what you're going to get told but when you're going for important appointments like that and you know you're getting a diagnosis or the results say a scan or whatever they do recommend that you take somebody with you for that reason yeah. because you're you're not hearing you're in shock you're not hearing anything else that's getting said to you yeah so what happened then after you got your diagnosis so it was just a case of you know what the next steps were and it was surgery so i was going to lose that testicle so you know. that's what so what is the procedure for testicular cancer i'm sure there's probably diff i don't know mm. right is there different levels grades whatever yeah. or is it an automatic removal of a testicle or what not not necessarily an automatic removal um so like so you can get you know like screening to see where you know you could get like um like a little bit of chemo or radiotherapy, so you don't necessarily have to get the removal. Um, I had what was called a stage two embryotic carcinoma, so my my cancer was actually growing inside my testicle like a chicken in an egg situation. Right. So, and the only reason that, that and that's why I was feel that's why I was so sore, and the only reason that I found the lump was actually the the testicle had herniated. So it was by mm -hmm. pure luck that I, I had a lump mm -hmm. because. If I hadn't have found that lump, I, I would have just took paracetamol and everything like any guy does, yeah, do you know what I mean? And just yeah. hoped that it went away. Um, so because all the the lymph nodes and everything, you know, are, all, are in your abdomen, testicular cancer is really bad at moving really quickly. So it can, you know, the, the likes, John Hartson's the best example of that, ex Celtic and Wales footballer, has ended up in his brain because he'd left it mm -hmm. too late to kind of be diagnosed at, at the early stages. So it moves so quickly, and because um, I had 
the embryotic, they just had to get rid of the um, testicle right away because there was you weren't going to save it as right. such. Um, so then it was from there I got my morcondectomy, which is like the removal. Uh -huh. And then it was discussing how many rounds of chemotherapy I was going to get. So you did need chemo yeah, as well. Yeah, that was so, just it, done with the removal. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, so when they got it, they were like, yeah, you're definitely going to need it. So I got a CT scan and there was cancer cells like at a really small minute level on my lymph nodes and my abdomen. So I got two rounds of um, a thing called BEP chemotherapy. And the big thing that's in that is like bleomycin, which is one of the kind of like hardcore um, cancer drugs and, and, plat and platinum is a heavy metal. So it's the thing that kind of makes your, your hair fall out and all that because mm -hmm. you're having... Uh, a talk a toxin put into you, so mm -hmm, yeah. Mm -hmm. And did that happen? Did you hear from? Yeah, I, I, I looked more like Uncle Fester than this glorious mm. bearded man you see and, before you. <laughs> and now, are you? What are you classed as? Are you cancer free? Technically, cancer, cancer free. free. Yeah. Right. So that's I'll be coming up um, ten years next year. So it's wow. ten year cancer free next year. So what age were you when I you got the thirty? Right. 30. So again, it's so important to say that because a lot mm. of people shrug issues of saying oh I'm too young mm -hmm. or you know this can't be happening to me yeah. because I'm whatever age or whatever so you were only 30. Yeah. So what does, so there's a few other things I want to ask you, so what does that mean for your future? What did it mean? What Did you want family? Did it restrict that? Did, was there any you know restrictions on your life moving forward? The, certainly like in terms of kind of my fertility and things like that, that was something that was beginning to be a problem so during the, the period of time where me and my wife, uh, we're actually, we were actually trying for a baby. Um, we had my son, um, um, he's not biologically mine, but he's mine, you know what mm -hmm. I mean? So um, mm -hmm. so we were trying for our, you know, our wee girl who we have ended up having um, at that time. And it was, it was difficult because we weren't conceiving, but then the cancer diagnosis hit. And you kind of go, okay, that, that the body's mm -hmm. yeah, maybe makes you. sense. Yeah, Aye. and then it was the the I think, and that's the biggest thing that I've started talking about now is the mental health aspect of losing a Tesco. It doesn't just about losing the Tesco; it is moving forward with like family. So the chemo could have wiped out my fertility mm -hmm. completely. That's why um, I'm asking. Yeah. About that. So. Mm -hmm. You know, it took us about two years and we were on the verge of going to IVF and we're really lucky that, you know, guys get the chance now to give a, like, uh, go to the sperm bank at the, the hospital and, you know, leave that um, just in case. Uh -huh. And you get, I think it's three rounds of IVF you get as well mm -hmm. after you've had So chemo. you could have froze your own sperm? Yep, is that, I, But you didn't do that? No, I did. I oh, did. you did, yeah, right. Yeah, okay, did. sorry, I'm yeah. talking my head. Right, uh, so you, that was an option that you used, that they gave you before the chemo started? Yeah, yeah. Right. So I had to go in and, and, and give that, and um, that was that was a story in itself. Do you know, it's like, it's the weirdest thing you have to go up with. <laughs> but do you know, know, I do want to talk about it because it's very similar to the process if you're starting infertility, regardless of any other issues. So yeah. we, we had just started on that journey of infertility, then I did fall pregnant naturally. But it's another thing that people don't really talk about because men get embarrassed about it. But if you want to, if you're desperate for a child and it's not happening and you want to go down the road of infer um, eye infertility treatment, mm -hmm. then there's certain things that you need to do before that and sperm count is one of them yep. before you're even referred to a specialist so you need to go over it aye, fellas you aye. need to go over it that is one of the things yep. you need to do so i imagine it's the same process you know you're having to capture the sperm in a wee cup yep aye. well i don't know it needs to be done with it. if you want to live and if if you want to pursue fertility treatment yeah and it's and it's embarrassing and it's uh it's thing, especially like when when I went and done mine, the the room that they put you in was right next to the staff room. So <laughs> I'm trying to, you know, give Aye. my sample, uh, and I could hear the staff. But at the time, uh, so when I worked in Fort Valley, I worked with this woman who, she, uh, the nicest woman, one of the nicest people you'll ever meet, right? But she uh, she got dragged away one day to get a picture taken, and she became the face of the flu jag posters. 
So as I shut the door, I'm pulling down my brakes, I look up and I can see Cathy looking at me <laughs> on one of these posters <laughs> and I was like, oh no, I was like, I can't do that. So I actually unpicked the cellar tape so that she wasn't watching. <laughs> What I can totally understand that. Imagine, it's because you're in the NHS, though, obviously, it's not, that's not the type of thing that's yeah. happened to usually the usual average job. No, they just look at it, they might be able to use it, you know, but <laughs> <laughs> certainly, I, I couldn't do that to her. Um, but yeah, and, and I think that this, it was quite stressful as well, you know, you know yourself then, uh, you know, there's a... a you feel emasculated as well when they talk about if you're trying to conceive and you're trying to do it naturally. And when it's when you when I, I knew that it was my fault, you know that because I say fault, but it was my, I was the reason that we couldn't mm, conceive. But 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 were you? Was it ever confirmed? Because although you obviously had your issue going on with your testicular cancer that you yeah. weren't aware of yet, was that definitely confirmed as the reason? Um, not a hundred percent, but the, you, they, just, uh, you just yeah. But when that. they talked about um, like the the mobility of the sperm and all that as well, so that's like how how they move and how quickly they move during that like first that first sample. I had enough healthy sperm, but the count was low, and that was probably to do with the, the fact that I and that one of them wasn't working properly. So they reckon then. Um, that once that was removed, that would have helped. Right. So it was highly likely. <coughs> yeah. Anyway, I just yeah. wondered about that. Yeah. So then, okay. you know, fast forward two years, um, we were going to the point of having to go up to Dundee for the first kind of like, you know, point of doing the the, the infertility treatment, and uh, we we're like, right, bugger it, let's just relax, let's just do something for us. So we went to Poland, uh, just for a, a holiday, came back, you know, and um, I think it was two weeks after that. You know, my wife was like, um, oh, I don't know, I feel quite funny and I feel quite gassy. And she said to her mum, and my mum jokingly said, do you might be pregnant? And she went, nah, I don't. And she was like, <laughs> so she took a pregnancy <laughs> test and turned out she, she was. was. And so she, she felt pregnant naturally. naturally. Oh, yeah. that's an amazing like, story almost, as well. Almost two years to the day of being told, you know what I mean? That, that you had cancer. Yeah. So have you still got your your sperm in storage frozen Weird, so you, weirdly yeah so uh, i got a letter the other day and i've actually not filled it out yet but i got a letter the other day where it it basically says do you want to destroy this or do you want to keep it for another 10 years uh, uh, so, can you donate it um i think you probably could i think you probably could but um yeah it's I, again just knew it, just, it was it was a weird letter to get and uh, i, I just no, knew to you anyway, yeah, getting that uh, letter and thinking so, about yeah. but i did wonder about that as yeah. well um, so you fell pregnant naturally. Well, your wife did fell pregnant yeah. naturally. That's a I great look like story. I did, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> no, you don't. No, you don't. Right. So going back to the actual treatment, I do want to talk about mental mm. health, and I do want to talk about catching it early and all of that as well. But yeah. the actual treatment for you then and the recovery. So I assume they would get you in quite quickly to remove that unhealthy testicle. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. And what was that like? It was kind of brutal, to be fair. Um, I think because of like the, because uh, everybody's different and every like physical body is different as well, uh, and some tubes are longer than and some and um, I ended up having to get like a, a kind of ten inch incision like into my abdomen, uh, so that they done that removal. And I remember. Is that how they do it? Yeah. Do so they? people people often misconstrue. They think they may just go in through the scrotum. And just take it out that way, but because of where the um, the blood vessels and all, they have to take the whole kind of like vascular system out with it, so that you know, so that there's no cancer um, still in the the, the mm -hmm. veins and the blood things and all that. So out it out, out they whipped that, and um, yeah. So when I went in for surgery, but actually one of my best friends' stepdad was in surgery the same day, and the first thing that I remember waking up was like, and my nickname's Chippy. Um, and I just, I remember kind of coming to and hearing, Chippy, Chippy, you all right, son? I'm like, oh, hi, John, a bit sad. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that, but that was nice to have somebody in the recovery room with me. But um, again, just a lot of pain and a lot of kind of, um, I don't think you kind of fully, uh, you fully realise how big a surgery it is because, I mean, they're really kind of having to go deep to get all this stuff out. So, 
Yeah, that was that was quite um, quite a lot actually. And I remember my wee boy. He was um, he came up to visit me after my surgery, and he'd said to my wife, he was like, "Mum, I don't think Dad looks great because I was obviously white yeah, as a I sheet and had to get know. kept in overnight and things like that as well." Is that all overnight? Ah, uh, just overnight. Uh, usually it's um, I see if I, if my pain uh, was down, they would have sent me away the same day. Jeez. Yeah, so, mm -hmm. and I think that's, I can see the sense in that yeah, as well. Yeah, it shows you how routine it is and how they, much yeah. they know what they're doing. But I, honestly, again, like, if anything was going to happen, it was going to happen to me. So, <laughs> the, the, the old nurse who was taking me to the, the, the new ward, she was like, right, son, I'll get, and she got all my stuff, and I'm lying in the bed, and she dropped it into my crotch. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> that's so weird. I can't believe By it. By accident. Yes and no, I mean, she probably knew what a surgery I had. But she, that was her giving you it to carry it yourself. <laughs> and I'm just like, oh. oh my God. So uh, yeah, up, up I went and then, yeah, and then it took, it was a, it was a month later, I was going to go into uh, the Beats in West of Scotland to, you know, talk about my, my chemo and, and what that was going to entail. So was the recovery, were you fine by then? Does it take a month to recover? Um, yeah, I mean, I think it, it took longer than that in terms of kind of the, the, the healing, in terms of the scar and, um, cause I had, there was loads of different things happened. Like I say, if anything happened, it happened to me, you know, like my wound dehissed. And so that means like, um, when it's stitched together, um, it, it basically broke away. So I had that happen. Um, I ended up with a hematoma, uh, which is like just a giant blood clot essentially. Uh, so much so that I thought they had put a, a fake testicle in. So I opted not to get the prosthetic. Right, so that's an option as well. Yeah, so they mm. can give you that. Some some guys I've heard like, so when I've spoke to guys, some guys are told that um, they'll just get it. Other guys are kind of when they've been young. So for testicular cancer, the age range that you predominantly get, it's between 15 and 45. And it's not to say that it can be under or over that, but that's your kind of age range. And one of the guys I spoke to, he was basically told like, you know, you're young, you're single. If you're getting sexually active, you might want to make sure that you have, you're able to disclose that you've only got one Tesco, like yourself, rather than it being, oh, you've only got one down there. It's like, mm -hmm. actually one of these is fake and it's it's up to you whether you say it or not type of thing. Aye. Eh? So, Aye. Um, so it's, and it's a, it's a good thing. I just, me and my wife were, you know, happy relationship. For me, my masculinity wasn't necessarily tied to my test skills. So I was like, I'm happy just having one that didn't really, mm -hmm. you know, I can be one ball, Paul. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> so, but everything, they don't adjust anything. Like you don't get skin removed because you're obviously, gonna have more skin than you need then yeah. but you don't none of that gets removed that just stays the same stays and the they same. just take the actual inside yeah out yeah basically. yeah basically yeah so mm -hmm. and then that i and that's and that's it and then it's then it's moving on to um getting your chemo and discussing how that's how that's going to go and what what's what course of treatment that you might need and again you know some guys got one dose of chemo you know, there's different types, you know, there's radiotherapy that they, they might do. But like I said, you know, I had to get two two rounds uh, at the beats mm -hmm. and so. And that was, that was scary in itself. Um, the only, the only time I'd really ever knew somebody who had cancer was a, a kid when I was growing up had leukemia. Mm -hmm. And, and unfortunately he died, you know, and you know, seeing him go through chemotherapy and you, that was that was your only real, like my only real real world view on what chemotherapy can do. Mm -hmm. So I was I was kind of terrified at, at that point. Right. It does come with a reputation of being absolutely brutal. Mm -hmm. So worth it, obviously. Yep. But it is a process that's brutal because as you say, it is a very strong toxin. Mm -hmm into your body understandably to kill any cancer that's like yeah. correct me if i'm wrong mm. when i'm describing any of this by the way because i haven't been through yeah. it um but it's the reason that you lose your hair like you've said but also the other thing is it really lowers your immune system doesn't it yeah. because it's killing everything else so you're at risk of all sorts of infection and whatever mm. so what was that like for you um again you know everything happens so like you you rightly said it lowers your immune system so uh 
I think I'd had my first round, and uh, because I remember my hair was out, and I was still, I was still quite sore from the surgery, so I ended up getting put in new painkillers and stuff like that to kind of help with that. But there was one day my dad came up to visit, and he was like, "I was like, Dad, I need to get out of the house. Like, I'm really need to get out of the house." So <laughs> we went to the the local ASDA, and um, as we're walking in, um, this woman sneezes as we're walking by, but doesn't cover our, our mouth. Oh no! So, <laughs> so then. I'm like, ah, well, I, I could just feel it spray me. Oh no. Um, and a week later, um, I'm in hospital <sighs> uh, with avian flu. Oh no. <laughs> I swear, I swear. So I had avian flu during it and I also ended up um, septic as well. So there was one night we were sitting watching telly and um, I was like, I had, um, I couldn't, my appetite wasn't great. So I had a wee bit of chicken and stuff like that. And then, we had bought a wee tub of Ben and Jerry's. I'm like, yes, I'll watch, I'll watch a bit of Kimmy Schmidt, eat some Ben and Jerry's. So uh, I'm eating the Ben and Jerry's and I, about an hour later, I'm going, I don't feel that great. I ended up going upstairs to be sick and it was like, violent, I was violently ill. And my wife was like, hey, Paul, there's something wrong. I'm like, no, I've just got a chill in my stomach. <laughs> no, I was septic. <laughs> so oh I ended up, mm. I was that sick that often. And I'd phoned and um, when you're going through treatment, you get this wee red book and it basically like it's all your protocols if you need to go back into the hospital and the numbers that you need to phone. So I ended up going back up to the Beatson early um, because I was going to be going in for treatment um, that weekend. So that got postponed because I was basically in a week before my, my chemo started uh, just to get so I went up and I collapsed and everything because I was basically on the brink of death. and. I remember saying to my dad, um, and that was the se sepsis. Sepsis, yeah. And I remember saying to my dad because he took me through because obviously the wee man was still really young. He was four, going on five at the time. So my wife had to stay in the house with him. My dad took me through. I remember saying to him, "Dad, do you believe in heaven?" Because I was like, I. Uh, you thought that was the end. I thought that that's yeah. it. I'm done. You know, and um, I uh, and I remember the look in his face and um, being like. Oh, didn't, didn't say that, didn't say that, but that moving forward, like in, in time went by, I'd heard that that's one of the, that's actually a, a side effect to sepsis as well. You do have a, your brain kicks into this mortality thing thinking that you're going to die oh, really? and that's what you mm -hmm. feel and that's that's exactly what I felt. I was like, I'm going to die. I'm I'm dying here tonight. And then thankfully they got the fluids into me, they got the antibiotics mm -hmm. in. Yeah, I. I'm here to and tell you the recovered. tale. Jeez, oh, and yeah. that wasn't the cancer. No, that, that was just because it, it was mm. I say, essentially because of the treatment. You know, like you say, Aye. my immune system was lowered and all that type of thing. So, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So, how long then were you recovering in that sense with the chemo and obviously getting over with sepsis? How long was that? Um, so that was probably the sepsis. I was in hospital for a for a week and getting all that, and then the, my blood levels came down, and then with the chemo. Um, I think from start to finish, essentially, I was I was done. That was January, February, so it was April, May time. Right, so um, four or five months, and yeah. that was you. After that, you were back to normal. Yeah, I right. yeah, mm -hmm. and then I we like we had we had booked a holiday because um, I've got family out in Philadelphia, so we booked a holiday to go see them the year prior, and it was kind of touch and go whether I could go or not. Insurance wouldn't they touch me. Do you know right. what I mean? Mm -hmm. uh, but we went, and it's funny. I still. We'll talk about things that happened in that holiday. I'm going, I kind of remember that because my brain was just Can away I, with it, kind mm -hmm, of hanging. Mm -hmm. so. You were still in a bit a state of shock, Pro maybe. Properly, yeah. Aye. Aye. It's interesting, that. Yeah. So, talking about going on holiday, so many things here. Um, so, one of my friends has been on the podcast talking about her cancer. She's got breast cancer, stage four she's living right. with. And there's a company, I wondered, it just this just popped into my mind, there's a company that does... Um, holiday insurance for cancer patients. Now, I don't know any of the criteria, but was that the spe a specialist company that you went to go on holiday? I didn't even do it. You done your wife right, did I it? Was right. like... <laughs> it's typical, right? So you don't have the answer to that. Anyway, that was just by yeah. the by. So going back, so what's your situation now? Are you to go for annual checks, or is it more than that? What no. So then? what happened? It used to be that you get seen uh, uh, um, for a period of time. So it'd be once a month, once every three months, then six months, then yearly mm -hmm. um, for ten years. 
as I was finishing my treatment, that protocol changed. So I was only looked after for five years after that. However, COVID hit. So it wasn't until two, was it last year, the year before? I think it was maybe last year, actually. I had my final CT scan and all that type of thing. So uh, so I ended up being looked after for eight years rather than just the five uh, and all that mm, type of thing. Mm, yeah, so. But now it is 10 years. Yeah. So you're now discharged. Yep. Is that right? Yep. So you wouldn't go back for a checkup based on that. But if anything else was to come up, you'd go back. Touch wood, it doesn't. Yeah, I'm aye. Just, aye. I'm just saying. Aye. Um, so, and that's the thing. It's like if... if yeah, you're discharged, but you know, I could I could phone up and say I've got this, and that actually happened. You know, I found a lump in my remaining testicle, oh, God. and uh, I mm. phoned up, and they were how really... long after was that? That was only this year, recent, yeah. Mm. So that was only this year, and I basically phoned up and got the and spoke to the CNS who works there, and she was great. She went, No, and she booked me in for an ultrasound, and Straight thankfully, away. I Aye. it was just a, a cyst. Aye. You know, mm-hmm. so, yeah. which a lot of time, a lot of the time it can be, mm-hmm. but it's always important to get it checked yep. anyway, yeah. regardless. So going back to like, I picked up on what you said about testicular cancer can spread really quickly yeah. if it's no caught in time and all of that. And I just want to reinforce that message about you know the minute you were very lucky and that you d- couldn't feel. Well, I say lucky. You know what I mean. Mm-hmm. You couldn't feel a lump but the pain was enough for you to then check yeah. for a lump and it turned out that you did actually yeah. catch it quite early. Just the whole thing there about, what would you say? What do cojones say when it comes to looking out for testicular cancer? Because this is actually even new to me because mm. I just always thought with cancer it was a lump. But no, yeah. no, based on what you're saying. So what are the things that you, what's the message that you put out to people to look out for? And if you've got any of these symptoms, regardless of whether you can find a lump or yeah. not, go and get it checked. Make an appointment with your GP, I yeah. assume in the first instance, as always is the case, then they'll yeah. refer you. So early detection is obviously the yes. big thing, you know. It, at a 96% rate for survival if detected early to stay like cancer is and unfortunately there's still deaths associated with it you know and it's it's a shame because it is such a a, a detectable cancer so as cojones we um well, richie came up with a check your balls for life campaign and life being an acronym for the four key symptoms that you can check for in the scrotum mm-hmm. so that's going to be kind of any lumps mm-hmm irregularities so that's any kind of pain and things like that any firmness so if the testicles any any one of your testicles feels firm or firmer than usual uh, and then enlargement so most guys have got um one bigger than the other Mm -hmm. but if you know your body and if you do these checks regularly you know which and we say once a month so if you do that once a month spend one minute on each testicle, I'm quite lucky. I just have to do it for half the time now. Uh, if, if we do, and if you do that, and you, that's what you're looking for in terms of what you feel on the testicle, you know, or within the scrotum. So it's lumps, irregularities, firmness, and enlargement. Mm-hmm. And it's a really simple key message to kind of help. There are other symptoms out there. You know, you could get lower back pain. You could feel fatigue, and and it's not to say that you would get all of the life symptoms in one go as well. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like we've had guys who had. Um, maybe a bit of pain. You had some who had, had like, their Tesco felt a little bit bigger, you know. So it's not having them all; it's having one of them, mm-hmm. you know, and just making sure you're right. Going to your GP as soon as you feel something. Do you different. know what that sounds very similar to? And there's a lot of women <coughs> watch this podcast, obviously, because mm-hmm. it's the like people follow like people. Of course, so a lot yeah. of women follow me. So it's, I suppose, it's what we're doing here as well as speaking to any men that watch directly is speaking to women to encourage their partners to check if their partner is male obviously um but it's very similar to the message for women checking their breasts yeah it's actually much the same and that it's any changes Mm -hmm. any changes at all it's not just about lumps it's you know anything that isn't what your breast normally feels like what your testicles normally feel yeah. like 
get it seen to yeah. straight away. And that's and when I go out and obviously and part of my job as a community engagement officer, we go out and uh, you know businesses, sports clubs, schools, you know anywhere that wants us, we'll go out and deliver this talk. And I always say that, especially to 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 young people who, you know, they've got busy lives, but you know if say if they play sport or or something for example they'll know if their shoulder does they feel right they'll not you know swing the bat or the club or or throw the ball because they'll know something's not right so if they get to know their testicles in the same way and by doing those monthly checks then you're going to pick up so quick that there's something wrong so if you've got that early detection it just it makes it better mm -hmm. in terms of kind of your treatment and things like that going forward Mm -hmm. yeah. As I always say, anyway, we're all checking for stuff like that. It's the difference between life and death, yep. really. It can yeah. save your life. Um, so the mental health side of it, Paul, because mm -hmm. that is massive as well. Again, especially where men are concerned. Um, what's the, What was it like for you, first of all? What was mental health? Because you've touched on that already, mm. you've said that you did actually struggle a wee bit. Yeah, I remember the point where I knew I wasn't right, and my wee boy was turning five, it was his fifth birthday, so, you know, I had been through my treatment, I was now, you know, four months, five months, like, in recovery at this point. So you're nearly at the end of the getting back to normal yeah then, getting yeah life back I, to normal. I my hair's maybe starting to come back a little and all that type of thing did Thinking, that affect you mentally losing my hair no losing my beard affected me <laughs> losing my hair that i didn't mind but uh, when, my beard, when my beard came off i was like oh but um uh -huh. again you know th maybe if i if you were to bring the psychologist in there they'd unpick me and say no no it did fall but, uh, uh, but as far as you're concerned that wasn't a big thing for you no no i think I, I, again i tried to just look at at it as a no well this is me getting better you know right. and mm -hmm. and when it did come back you know it's straightened out now but it came back curly as well so i was gutted to see when those, oh, see when those curls that, left me but, mm -hmm. gutted oh that's a shame but, um, so anyway, I interrupted you. No, then, so fine. you were coming to the end of your treatment. Yeah. So basically, you know, I had like I had no more chemo to get, and I was sitting in the bath, and I remember, like, I think the one thing that people think depression is about feeling sad. For me, you know, and my depression came with feeling nothing, and I was in the bath just feeling numb, and just watching the trap, the tap drip. And there was people starting to come down the stairs because it was a wee man's birthday. And um, and I remember going down, eventually get myself down the stairs. The water had went cold by this point. I went down the stairs and I, I was looking around the room and I just wasn't, I wasn't feeling any joy. I wasn't feeling any sadness. It was just nothing. And I remember saying to my wife, can you come through? And I heard our mum say, like, is Paul okay? And got into the kitchen and I just broke down. I went, um, there's something wrong. I'm not right. Like, I don't feel right. And I phoned the GP, and luckily I was able to get an emergency appointment that day. And I went and spoke to the the doctor, and then got put on an antidepressant. And that was the kind of the start of that. And over the years, having kind of been able to kind of sit and think on it, and it's it's such a massive toll because I was trying to be so positive during my my treatment and. I trying to make sure that I was still appearing to be me for people because actually I think most people who have had a cancer you know they'll they'll go oh I've got cancer and you'll you'll see it in somebody else's face and then you end up going oh, it's all right I'm okay and you'll reassure them you know and you, you do that reassurance for them rather than for yourself so I think that was the hardest part is was coming out of that and then feeling this weight of oh my god I've had cancer. You hear it all the way through and you have emotional points knowing that, but it was a very life altering thing and it really it, it started to impact me mentally as well and then I went back to work too early and things like that as well. And, had you been you know, off the whole time you were getting the treatment? Yeah. By the time you went to the GP and the antidepressants were prescribed, were you back at work at that point? No, I was, I was about to go back. So that was the August and I was aiming to be back in the November and I did go. Uh, thinking, well, maybe I'm just, you know, need to get back into a normal routine and that'll help me, you know, 
feel better about myself and and I just never, you know, and um, I think for a long time, I, th there's such a stigma on testicular cancer that I couldn't say that I was a survivor because it was only testicular cancer. That was the thought that I had at the time. But actually, you know, now I'm quite proudly, you know, no, I'm a testicular mm -hmm. cancer survivor and, you know, this is what I do. But at the time, the stigma around it was still as such that I felt embarrassed to call myself a, a survivor and people go through worse types of cancer than me. And it's like, well, actually, no, you went through quite a big mm -hmm. deal. So, yeah, that was that was the hardest part of, of that was coming to terms with the fact that, yeah, I had survived something bigger then uh, I kind of gave it credit for, mm -hmm. if that mm -hmm. makes sense. Mm -hmm. So the mental health part then, mm -hmm. do you think, was it classed as PTSD? Did, it, was that mentioned? No, I, I, it's been spoke about recently because I'm actually like, um, because I, I, it's never really left me and it's been great being like, kind of talk to guys and, and speak about it and, and find out, doing my job as a community engagement sort of, but also on the podcast and you're speaking to guys, it makes you feel a little bit better, but actually it kind of puts you back in a place. So I ended up, I'm on the waiting list for psychology and that was one of the things when I got my so pre-appointment. So you're still managing it now, so interesting, yeah, that's so important to talk about it. Um, so you were going to say, I asked you about PTSD, was that mentioned? Yeah, so that was because it's obviously, it's still a trauma, you know, yeah. it's um, massive. So, yeah. It's massive. And, and again, there's a funny thing with that because, again, I think PTSD and I think, you know, like my cousin was in the army and he witnessed some horrific stuff when he was over in Afghanistan and those guys are PS PTSD. And again, you kind of put yourself down going, you're I can have that. You're belittling yeah. your situation, but I've heard that so many times from people, not just cancer, any life-threatening diagnosis that a person is given yeah. is is just, I, I, I don't even know it myself because it's not happened to me, but listening to other people, it is mentally, it's one of the hardest things you can have to deal with. You're yeah. facing potentially death yeah. and you know it for, you know that yeah. you can google it for cancer you know it's just it isn't just about the emotional side uh, sorry the physical mm. side yeah. of it it's the, the emotion and the mental health and, and it's the one part as well that we talk about well i talk about more and more uh, in my role as cojones because i think that in, in my own situation and knowing the guys that like, i mean we've you know we've got a, a great wee community building the test like cancer survivors but almost all of them, to a person, will say, you're given your treatment, the physical aspect's done, and then that's you. And people don't look after the the emotional side. And typically, you know, as, as Scottish men, you know, especially when, when it comes to physical, especially when it comes to mental health, we're really bad at going to the GP for a, a physical health. You know, I put off a testicular lump, mm -hmm. um, you know, so the fact that I'm just feeling know myself, I'm not going to go to the GP for that. It's typically what happens. So if we can try and, as cojones, help guys, especially that are going through testicular cancer treatment at any stage to go, there's more to this than just um, the, the, the physical, physical. aspect. Mm -hmm. of, and that's what we try to, I try to incorporate in the educational stuff as well. It's like in, when I'm speaking to businesses or sports clubs to say, yeah, actually, it's it's not just about to stick like cancer. It's about the mental health aspect of that and how that encompasses. Because losing a test goal is hard enough. On you know somebody, it'd be the same if somebody um, had a mastectomy. It, it's it, it's you're losing a part of yourself, whether you think it or not. Mm -hmm. It's so, all part of your identity, mm -hmm. regardless of who you are. Those things are part of your identity. So you got your. Um, prescription of antidepressants. I want to talk more about that mm -hmm. actually. Are you is that are you still on antidepressants? Yeah. Right. Yeah. So that's been since then. Mm -hmm. But what you talked about you're waiting on an appointment with a psychology. A so yeah. what else has happened there for you? Like it's, you know, like in terms of your mental health. Yeah. Well it's 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 always just been this kind of underlying um anxiety. So I was never an anxious person um previously, you know I it's funny, you know, I remember like the first time of feeling dead anxious and I wasn't actually able to put, put a name to it and my wife and Paul 
that's anxiety. Welcome to the real world. That's what yeah. people feel. Because mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I've always just been a kind of like, hey, you know, quite what kind does of your wife do? She actually works in the psychiatry. Right. Yeah, okay. So, I, I yeah. wondered if you were both in, because you're not in healthcare anymore. No, obviously, no. you work full time. Do you work full time with yeah. owners, right? Yeah. But we will come back to that. It was interesting that. She was the one to say to you, you yeah. know, that's what it is. And and I think like having stuff like that, so I was never really fully on top of that. I tried to come off my antidepressants as well because again, antidepressants come with their own side effects and you know, like um weight gain, you know, poor libido, all these types of things happen. So you try to come off them but I I just wasn't able to and, and then I've just changed my tablet as well. So I was on Cetraline and now I'm on Citalopram, mm -hmm. which and is you finding that better? Yeah, I mean, sexually, and see that first kind of round, like after my like my chemo and things like that, worked great. But the longer I was on them, I found that it was actually making me. There was a coming a point where I was feeling more anxious, and it was like, and that was, you know, because of the way that it, um, it works. Mm -hmm. So going on to the citalopram has helped. It's like it's lessened that anxiety, but kind of mutes everything else a little bit mm -hmm. you know it's like I, I, i'm a big baller you know so i'll watch marley and me and i'll be dying do you know what i mean like I, 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 my wife laughs at me because like she she watches grace anatomy and i'm gonna be coming down the stairs and there'll be a sad scene i've not watched any the rest of the show but i'll be greeting with them 30 seconds do you know what i mean aye. so stuff like that stops as such aye. but mm -hmm. um but it, it has helped and it's helped relieve that anxiety it's helped me move forward in terms of kind of um, like my mood's better, you know. I, I, I would never say that I had um, suicidal thoughts, but I had thoughts of, you know, like just like I could just drive the car straight into the wall. Do you know that type right. of thing? Mm -hmm. And that that was what was worrying, you know, the fact that mm -hmm. I wasn't able to get out of that. Mm -hmm. And you're, so you're still dealing with that. You're mm -hmm. still dealing with your mental health. So how did you get the psychologist appointment? Where did that come from? Just going to my GP and... So you're still uh, no right? You've still, yeah. so you went back. What was wrong that made you go back? I think just that overwhelming feeling, you know, like it coming, you know, I I, th I, I was definitely a lot, I was, I was feeling a lot more aggy. You know, so I'd be kind of like... You know, <laughs> Technical uh, term, uh, <laughs> But I was definitely feeling not myself and a bit sharper to kind of, like, it's like, I always say, like, in my entire life, I've always had a, a really hard fuse to light, you know? Um, but it's just always, like, things were just, I know, just, you know, and just being an angry man. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so that was not right, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and you don't want to kind of take that out in anybody, so... I going to the, the the GP and just discussing that and uh, and the way that I was feeling, the fact that I wasn't sleeping and things like that as well. So just yeah. loads of lifestyle, different things. Yeah. And were they quite happy, or she quite happy mm. to refer you to a psychologist? Yeah, I I mean they're they're, they're pretty good at um, making sure that you know that the the service is there. Unfortunately, you know, in in Scotland the psychology waiting list, especially in Fort Valley, is is massive. Mm -hmm. So. Even though I've been referred to a psychologist, it's going to be another eighteen months before I see anybody, mm -hmm. as well. So mm -hmm. it's you're quite um, lucky. That's the only way I can think to put it to get a referral mm -hmm. as well, though, from the GP because it's not just Fort Valley; it's everywhere. The yeah. psychologist lists are massive. Have they given you any indication of how long you'll need to wait? No, it, it could be anywhere between a year and, and two. And more, you know, so aye. yeah, mm -hmm. um, I've had my initial consultation and, and spoke through and there's obviously we any type of psychology there's obviously other stuff in your life that they kind of go that's going to have affected you that's going to and then you've had this big trauma on top of all these other little things so yeah mm -hmm. you know were you affected by mental health before the cancer or did the cancer diagnosis trigger everything for you i can't say that i, I kind of was as such maybe that you know i'm looking back you could argue maybe yeah but i didn't feel it like that at the time mm -hmm. but certainly that was the um that moment of sitting in the bath and not f and just this day of joy and not me not feeling anything was definitely a no, no, the, this isn't right for me. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it was at that point, a really. A turning point for you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's good to hear that. I hope you do get the support that mm -hmm. you need. So, going back to the page then and the work that Cajonas does. How many people work for the charity? Two of us. Just yeah, you, Richie. Just me, Richie, oh, yeah. God love you. Yeah. Um, what do you do? What's your 
what does a, a, a roughly a typical week look like for you? Chaos for us. <laughs> Chaos for us. Well, but... if there is only two of <laughs> these, uh, I imagine it would be. Yeah. We yeah. are we are everything and all thing together, but you know what we. It's my job as a community engagement officer. I, it's essentially it's it's making sure that I'm delivering the message of self checks, early detection, and getting that life message out there. So that can be going into schools, um, businesses. So yesterday I was at a, a business um, in Grangemouth called IKM, and they had done a men's health because it's November's typically Men's Health uh, Awareness Month. Mm-hmm. Um, to state like Cancer Awareness Month is, is in April. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, um, but it's doing but things like that. But you've already identified it's more than just testicular cancer, although that's your main thing. Mental health is massively part very much of it. intrinsic mm-hmm. to the, the the thing as well. Um, so yeah, and giving educational talks. So you know, going into schools is is always great, um, and being able to just do a thirty to forty minute session, just you know, advocating for you know people to be proactive. And like you so rightly said, you know, I hear a lot of your. Um, listeners, stroke watchers are going to be female, but they're always the best people to encourage. Exactly, you know, exactly, you know. because we are the ones that have got less embarrassment. And yep. generally speaking, I, yeah. mean, I don't want to be accused of being sexist, but generally speaking, a, a woman will confront an oh, issue definitely. quicker and more head on. And they're more likely to, to, to talk about it. And you know, I, you know that women will talk about, you know, breast cancers openly and things like that. And whereas guys don't. You know, I remember doing a talk at one of the schools uh, through in Stirling. And um, in fact, it was Dollar Academy. And I knew somebody's daughter who was there. So it was an old friend of mine. Her daughter was in there because I always say, please don't just make it the boys. I want the girls to be there as well because mm-hmm. boys should know about breast mm-hmm. cancer girls mm-hmm. should know about mm-hmm. you know and i know i'm being very kind of gender specific yeah. but no we uh, know what you yeah, mean but uh, um but so that day um my friend's daughter went home and said to her dad here there's a sleep for the honus paul says you have to check yourself <laughs> so <laughs> if you've got people uh, that can advocate for us like that uh, as well so uh, and then it's just you know it's i mean richard deals with you know fundraising and coming up with campaigns as well so i did want mm. to ask you that we're coming up to an hour how mm. are you fun- funded is it is it through public uh, donations or do you get or is it both grants and public donations um, so we're self-funded so anything that's like public funded so any uh, donations that we get and um, we have had some funding over the last couple of years from you know like big lottery and things like that right. um but little to no government funding and the 15 years that Richie's kind of ran Cajonas he's maybe only had about £80,000 worth of funding when you look at other charities running for the same amount of time they might get that over two years so it's we're getting there and we're getting the name out there and we're we're delivering these talks and that's it can you can you make donations on your Instagram page is there a link I think there I think there There is is a link there but I wasn't sure and you can go to the um, you can go into the uh, the website and there's a donate donation button there. Uh, yeah. But the big mm-hmm. thing, you know, uh, just to kind of to round up on. Aye. I was going yeah. to ask you that anyway. <laughs> what is what is the message that you want to get out yeah. there? If there's anything we can help you with, what yeah. is it? It's check yourself. That's mm-hmm. that's the big message, you know, to anybody who's listening. You know, encourage people. You know, make them do it. You know, it's once a month, one minute each Tesco, and all you're doing is taking the Tesco on your your three fingers and rolling it around uh, to feel for any of those lumps, irregularities, firmness and enlargement. Um, it, it literally could save your life. It saved mine. And I know that sounds really, really grandiose, but it really did. But it does. It, it, it does. does. Um, and, and also, you know, guys who are going through treatment um, are getting a, a chemo care box um, for nothing from Cojones. So um, it's filled with stuff. Uh, to, it's got toast toasties, it's got chilies bottles, it's got ball bag underwear in it. So... Mm-hmm. They're getting a massive big care box, stuff for brushing their teeth, unscented smells like uh, deodorants and things like that. So they get a, a proper hug in a box for us. So mm-hmm. that, and that's our, our, our key thing that's now national. Mm-hmm. So we might only be two guys, but we're up and down the country. Yes, and you're encouraging people to get in touch with you. Very much well. so, yeah. yeah. And you're there to offer support. Kohonas will obviously be tagged, and I'll invite you to collaborate mm-hmm. on this on Instagram. So, um, 
is there a take it the inbox is always open and even always. if there are women that want to ask questions or anybody Definitely. in yeah. fact yeah you're happy to hundred percent yeah it'll likely be me or richie so honestly like i get me i'm i'm across social media as well as cojones paul so you can I, get me i will tag yeah. you as well so that yeah. people have got your contact because you just can't you just can't put enough out there to be yeah. honest to raise yeah. awareness and whatever thank you so oh, thank much you. for that you've educated me on <laughs> a lot of things as well because like i say this is the first time we've actually i've had somebody talk about specifically testicular cancer so thanks very much oh, thanks for having me on no problem cheers see you later bye <laughs>